Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. The Iowa History 101 webinars share Iowa stories and the history of the state through a cultural history lens on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about the Friendship Train, which volunteers sent across the nation collecting food donations to help the hungry in Europe at the end of the Second World War. The people of Iowa were most generous and have a long history of giving freely to those in need, which they proved by contributing more food than any other state. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our, introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Matt Beyer, is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dave Mills. Dave is an associate professor at the United States Army Command and General Staff College, located at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where he teaches military history to senior captains and majors from each branch, branch of the military. He holds a PhD from North Dakota State University and is the author of three books on the military and Cold War history. His current research project is entitled Bread for My Enemies, Feeding Germany from the Fall of Hitler to the Marshall Plan. He has been married to his wife, Anne, for almost 30 years, and they have three grown sons. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Dave to begin the webinar. Well, greetings, everybody. Hey, uh, I'm Dave Mills, and like the uh, like Jennifer said, this presentation is a result of the, the research that I'm doing into my next book that looks at the starvation conditions in Germany after World War II and the American effort to feed our former enemies. So this presentation is going to focus on the freedom train and the effort to collect food and send it to France and Italy, two nations that were suffering tremendously in the post-war era. I will also give you some background information on the food situation in Europe. In some, food was short everywhere with starvation rampant in some areas. The war had disrupted agricultural uh, production and the Cold War was in full swing. The Truman administration was concerned that communism would spread in the chaos and misery. So feeding Europe was a priority as an anti-communist measure, as a humanitarian gesture, and it was also a challenge. European agriculture was so devastated after the war that the United States was having problems sending enough grain to make up the difference between what Europe could produce and the minimal amount of grain needed to keep people alive. While government agencies were also trying to free up grain for Europe through official channels, the idea was to send a train from Los Angeles to New York City, collecting food donations along the way for shipment to Europe. The project blossomed and spread until six more trains rolled through different areas of the country. Organizers hoped to collect 70 boxcars of donated foods. They collected over 700 between the numerous train projects. One note, you can see that the train split in two in Chicago. So please keep that in mind as I talk to you about the two trains later. So this is the story of how a project requiring generosity teamed up with the most generous people in the country. The people of Iowa have always been kind with their donations as depicted by these accounts. You see floods and earthquakes, and this is even before the 20th century when the government uh, intervened, it was the norm in humanitarian uh, disasters. But by far the most devastating event was the Russian famine from 1891. In 1891, drought in the spring had resulted in Russia suffering from a devastating grain harvest. You can see the large area to the southeast of Moscow that was heavily hit. 
the humanitarian disaster had spread so that by October, the Russian government announced that a complete harvest failure had taken place in 13 provinces and partial failures occurred in seven more. The Tsarina donated 20 million rubles from her private account to assist the starving, while peasants in the east of Russia sent this letter to the Tsar saying, we are suffering from famine. The government does nothing to help us and our only hope is thee, our father and Tsar. Please don't let us die of starvation. Millions were hungry and faced a slow and agonizing death unless the generosity of others more fortunate prevailed. The call went out for collections and donations to send to that foreign land. And in fact, this was one of the first international missions for the Red Cross. Clara Barton, the founder of the Red Cross, singled out Iowans for their kindness, the only state to receive that distinction. She said that the state of Iowa led all others in active generosity. That state raised and sent in trains across the country from Iowa to New York, 117,000 bushels of corn and 100,000 pounds of flour. One of Iowa's favorite sons also had an important role to play in food relief. During World War I, Herbert Hoover helped send food through the British blockade of Europe and into Belgium. After the war, he's helped send food to Germany and after the Russian Revolution, he helped send food to that nation, despite Germany and Russia being international pariahs. Often grateful Belgians took the sacks that contained donated flour and embroidered them and sent them back to Hoover as a thank you, as depicted here. We'll hear more from Mr. Hoover in the next few minutes. At some point, I'm actually going to start talking about the friendship train, but in order to do that, I need to set the stage a little and focus on Germany and how their plight after World War II affected the rest of Europe. Before the war, Germany had only been able to produce about 80% of the food they consumed, the other 20% they imported. Once they overran all of Europe during World War II, they simply took what they needed, leaving their neighbors to starve. France, Belgium, Austria, and Holland suffered terribly, and even Italy was in dire straits by the end of the war, despite being allied with Germany. Once the war was over, the Allies divided Germany among the three victorious powers and then invited France to be an occupation power. The idea was that each of the four zones would treat Germany as one economic unit, trading between zones to provide the people with the necessities required. However, both France and the Soviet Union were difficult to deal with, and the more agricultural East refused to trade their goods to the more industrial West. The people of Europe were hungry, and some reg regions starving right after the war. The people of Germany were starving as well, and this situation grew worse in the post-war period. The Soviet Union had taken land from eastern Poland, moving the Russian border hundreds of miles to the west. To compensate Poland for the loss of territory, the Allies took German territory and gave it to Poland. Specifically, the area is marked Polish on this map. Unfortunately, this was the most fertile agricultural land in Germany. Now they could not even produce the amount of food that they had before the war, and they had about 10 million more mouths to feed as a result of the slave labor brought into the Reich during the war and the millions of Germans expelled from Eastern Europe, now living in the Western zones, who also had to be fed. If this was just a German problem, that would be one thing, but hunger extended throughout Europe. Farm fields were destroyed during the war, there was almost no farm machinery, fertilizers, or seeds anywhere, and many European farmers were either dead or still prisoners of war. This picture shows civilians in Italy waiting for scraps from the tables of American soldiers. This same procedure was repeated throughout Europe. Also in Italy, a soldier pours beans into the hat of an Italian civilian. Elsewhere, in Germany, 1947, the sign reads, we want coal, we want bread. This was a circular problem throughout Europe. 
mining coal was hard work. It required a lot of energy or calories to carry it out. Many European nations lacked food for their miners, and in turn, there was little coal to heat homes or power factories. So Europe starved and froze. Thousands of Europeans suffered from frostbite during the winters. Many families burned their furniture and portions of their homes and outbuildings if they had them to stay warm. At that time, hardworking Americans consumed about 3,200 calories per day. Laborers in Britain took in about 2,800 calories. But in Europe, there were 13 countries whose citizens took in less than 1,900 calories per day. And of those 13 nations, six of those countries took in less than 1,500 calories per day per citizen on average. Health experts maintain that an average of 2,200 calories was the minimum required for, for humans to maintain good health individually, but millions of, of Europeans took in less than 1,000 calories a day, which was where starvation set in, first exemplified in disease and death in infants, children, and the elderly. By 1946, there were at least 20 million diseased and malnourished, and malnourished children on the continent, and probably more, as there were an estimated 11 million orphans and half orphans alone. The mortality rate for children under two years of age was 25%. In the short term, the Truman administration set a minimum threshold of 1,500 calories per day for all European citizens as a goal. This starvation was a disaster from a humanitarian perspective. And to the Truman administration, it also foreshadowed the rise of communism in Europe. As everyone knew, communism thrived in misery and chaos. In Holland at the end of the war, a diet of 500 calories per day was common, where people might get one loaf of bread and five potatoes for the week. In this picture is nine, a nine-year-old Dutch boy, Henke Halvis, who was in the habit of carrying a spoon with him wherever he went, just in case, as he said. As General Lucius Clay, the military commander of occupied Germany noted, there is no choice between being a communist on 1,500 calories a day and a believer in democracy on 1,000. By now, I think you get the idea. Food is a problem in Europe in the post-war era. It is particularly a problem in Germany, but few people had much sympathy for our former enemy at the time, especially once news of the Holocaust became widespread. However, harvests in the United States broke all records during the war years, and 1945 was no different. Corn and wheat were as plentiful as they had ever been, and it seemed like a simple solution to divert some of the wheat away from American markets and send it to Europe. Unfortunately, the Allies had put little thought into the occupation of Germany until after the war ended in May of 1945. Roosevelt was the consummate politician who never wanted to be tied down to a particular policy, preferring, preferring to keep his options open. In 1944, Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau had come up with a plan that essentially punished Germany forever. It envisioned turning Germany into an agricultural nation with no industry whatsoever. Fortunately, this plan was scrapped when Truman came into office in 1945, but the plan that took its place was still incredibly harsh, allowing only a small amount of manufacturing. This meant that Germany had no exports to pay for imported food and would forever be dependent upon American food donations, which amounted to almost a billion dollars between 1945 and 1948. What the Allies did not understand was that all of European economies were intertwined, including Germany's. You could not rebuild Europe without rebuilding Germany. There was no centralized plan to feed the people of Europe after the war. Food and farming was their problem. Although the US Army had been feeding many European countries with excess military rations through December of 1945. It was about this time that the Truman administration admitted that Europe needed a significant amount of aid and a serious effort was required to stave off starvation 
and death in some countries, even as thousands died every month from starvation-related diseases. Nobody was quite sure how much wheat was on hand in government warehouses and available for shipment. At the height of the harvest in 1945, there had been 1.4 billion bushels of wheat on hand. By the first of the year, only three months later, almost half of the harvest was gone. The government was still paying farmers a wartime price for wheat, and they were terrified of building surpluses. So they had encouraged farmers to feed wheat to their livestock. In addition, Americans were tired of sacrifice. They had done without complex diets for over 10 years during the Great Depression and the four years of World War II. Food consumption in the United States was way up in the post-war years. Thus, there was little food available to ship to Europe. The idea of sending 1,500 calories per person per day to Europe was no longer a goal. It was a hope. Truman asked the farmers to stop feeding wheat to animals and to bring it to market, which took some time to get into the system. In order to find food for shipment to Europe, Truman started the Fam Famine Emergency Committee in early 1946 with Herbert Hoover as its honorary chair. The objective was to get ordinary Americans to consume less wheat and grain products in order to free up grain for shipment overseas. However, the effort was a bust. Citizens could not see how skipping a slice of bread at mealtimes would matter in the overall scheme of things. The only thing that kept Europe from widespread starvation was the effort of Herbert Hoover, who traveled the world in 1946, visiting dozens of countries, seeking excess grain for shipment to areas where food was short, or convincing nations not to import food at all asking them to sacrifice for the greater good. In the end, the United States shipped about 450 million bushels of wheat and other grains to Europe. This was only a small amount of the grain needed there, where diets of 1,000 to 2,000 calories per person were common throughout 1946. As you can see in the upper left, Hoover met with Pope Pius XII, who was, an extreme, who was extremely helpful and supportive. The Pope created a broadcast on shortwave radio and aimed at South America and its largely Catholic population. The Pope asked the people there to cooperate with Hoover's mission, sacrificing so that others may live. Hoover had nothing but praise for the Pope and his kind gesture, which did open doors for him. In the lower left-hand corner, Hoover is meeting with officials from Argentina, which was one of the few nations with excess grain to export. Officials there generously gave much of their excess grain for shipment to Europe, despite our poor relationship with them. He also met with Mahatma Gandhi, whose nation of India was also suffering from famine, and Hoover helped arrange shipments of food there also. Expectations were high in 1947, but things did not improve as frost and then drought had devastated the European harvest. After pulling out all the stops and sending 450 million bushels of wheat and other grains in 1946, Europe needed that plus another 100 million bushels in 1947. Truman started the Citizens Food Committee, which asked citizens to voluntarily sacrifice as before, including designating uh, meatless and wheatless days in the American diet, the Truman administration also worked with the food industry to save grain. Truman shut down whiskey distillers for 90 days. He asked poultry producers to cull their flocks and to limit the number of new chicks produced. They also worked with the baking industry to limit the size of pies and cakes and to reduce the amount of bread available for purchase. Here, Truman and Charles Luckman, the head of the Citizens Food Committee, give the first televised uh, press conference from the White House in 1947. They were announcing the program of the Citizens Food Committee and asking the people for their support. With all of the publicity around the effort to save grain, people came up with some ingenious ideas to help out. 
One of those people was Drew Pearson, a syndicated journalist who wrote the popular Washington merry-go-round column, and he had a radio show heard on over 200 stations. He also had a plan, one that would thwart the growing communist menace in Europe and provide food for those who needed it. He envisioned a freedom train, or sorry, a friendship train, leaving from Los Angeles and crossing the country, picking up donated food for shipment to Europe along the way. Pearson announced his concept on October 11th in his column. He wrote that the idea was going to become reality only two weeks later. And by November 7th, a train was idling in the Los Angeles rail yards, waiting to roll across the country and on its way to New York City. The Citizens Food Committee had gotten involved and supported the idea, using their contacts with the business community to get trains quickly coordinated and set their plan in motion, but without fanfare. Truman did not want the people to think that this was a government operation. It would have more support, he believed, if it seemed to be a grassroots effort. So you can tell the popularity of the effort by the cartoon on the left, which reads, we'd better quit that food saving idea of yours if you expect me to grow into these old pants of pops. So this cartoon was, was published as the, friendsh the uh, friendship train was gaining popularity and support. Celebrations to send off the friendship train in Los Angeles was a star studded affair. Governor Earl Warren officiated the ceremony that christened the Mercy Train just before a huge parade kicked off the celebration. A press release from the local Los Angeles Friendship Train Committee claimed that the evening parade that meandered through the city streets was one of the most brilliant and star-spangled parades in Los Angeles history and followed a 15-mile route with hundreds of searchlights lining it. The local committee erected bleachers for the free use of over 100,000 spectators that lined the parade route. And beginning at 8.30 p.m. local time, a half hour coast to coast and international broadcast explained the mission of the, freedom, for the friendship train. Hollywood stars often maligned and not often applauded for their citizenship, according to Pearson, also came out and gave the train a glorious send off. Well, some were questioning whether or not the actors union would allow them to appear at the celebration. But an inquiry sent to the president of the Screen Actors Guild, Ronald Reagan, met with immediate approval. John Wayne, who I believe also has Iowa roots, came out in support as well. All of the food collected on the friendship train was designated for France and Italy, where communist influence seemed to be gaining popularity. Pearson wanted the people there to know that the food came from the United States with no strings attached, and it was a gift. He envisioned train cars loaded right into the ships so that the placards and signs on the sides of the cars could be read in Europe. But the rail gauges were different there. So the cargo would have to be unloaded from the train and onto a ship and then loaded onto trains and trucks once it arrived in Europe. However, new placards were printed and kits with hammers and nails were available to place the placards on the sides of the European rail cars. As the train rolled across America, it was scheduled to make six stops in Iowa at Council Bluffs, Boone, Ames, Marshalltown, Cedar Rapids, and Clinton. By the time the train left Iowa, it will have collected 22 rail cars more than any other state. Iowa Governor Robert D. Blue boarded the train in Omaha, Nebraska on November 12, 1947, continuing the tradition of governors riding the train across their state. With them were French Ambassador Henri Bonnet, Italian Representative Nicola Fioli, Tom Slater of the National Citizens Food Committee, Andrew Pearson, the creator of the Friendship Train Project. The governor and 500 shivering members of the crowd, standing in 20 degree temperatures in the early morning hours, 
watched as crews connected five rail cars full of food to the train that would cross Iowa. This was the most rail cars collected at any single stop thus far, according to Pearson. The train left Council Bluffs at 8.50 a.m. on November 13th and proceeded along a scheduled route across Iowa, pulling 17 cars. The Friendship train pulled into the next stop at Boone, Iowa the same day. Over 3,000 children and adults took part in a parade celebrating the train's arrival, while several marching bands from throughout Boone County added an air of celebration to the arrival. A cheering crowd estimated between 12 and 15,000 people was on hand to greet the train and its designated passengers. Drew Pearson received wild applause as he and others thanked the members of the Boone community for their generous donations. Contributions from Boone and the surrounding communities equaled four rail cars, including one of cornmeal, one of corn, two filled with wheat, and total food and cash contributions from Boone totaled $12,713.40. Story County, Iowa, where Ames is the largest city, had set a goal of collecting two carloads of food for the Friendship Train. To achieve this goal, the city had organized a committee charged with raising $10,000 in donations. School children throughout the county had collected evaporated milk as their contribution, while the committee had set up collection sites for food and cash donations at banks and stores throughout the county. The Ames Grain and Coal Company accepted donations of grain from local farmers and individual donors could mail cash donations directly to the committee. And to ensure that they missed no potential donor, the committee organized a house to house collection effort in the days leading up to the train's arrival. The city saw other creative efforts to raise money, such as the Elks Club of Ames, an organization that donated $200 to the Freedom Train, that arranged to auction off a donated mule, appropriately named Jenny, pictured in the paper, with the $205 winning bid also going towards the purchase of food for the train. Drew Pearson spoke to the assembled crowd in Ames, telling them that the point of the friendship train was to acquaint the people of Europe with the fact that the food is coming from the American people. The friendship train will be one method of com combating the insidious propaganda of some countries taking credit for our gifts of food. He was referring to the communists throughout Europe who often took credit for the unlabeled flour and wheat sacks which was why he was often so insistent that the sacks, ships, and rail cars have American labels. Governor Blue followed Pearson, telling the crowd, we have gathered to extend the hand of friendship to the hungry people across the sea. The most important things for the people of the world today is to learn how to live together. The cash collection effort which included communities surrounding Ames, was a tremendous success as well, with $15,780.88 collected. The town purchased two carloads of flour and one more of evaporated milk for shipment to Europe, while collection efforts in Des Moines had raised enough cash to purchase another car of condensed milk, which was also attached at Ames. When the train arrived in town, the Ames High School marching band provided music to the brief celebration carried out while the engineers connected the additional cars. Collections continued throughout the state. Food committees in Marshalltown collected over 60,000 pounds of food, enough to fill one rail car with a variety of needed goods. Railroad crews connected it, and then the train moved on. One of the most interesting donations from Marshalltown was the ton of honey from Sam Meyer, a local farmer. But a local man, Joe Crantman, promised to donate as much cash as Meyer donated money. So at 25 cents per pound for 2,100 pounds of honey, Crantman made good on his promise with a $525 donation to the Friendship Train.
A crowd of between 10 and 15,000 assembled at Green Park in Cedar Rapids to celebrate the train's arrival and present the carloads of oats for shipment to Europe. The, trains, the town's achievement was the result of only a few days effort by an energetic committee. One of the members, Rex Kahn, farm editor of the Cedar Rapids Gazette said that, well, we know that the friendship train will provide only a drop in the bucket to what is required, but it will make the French and Italians aware that the United, that the United States is the nation that is feeding them. At the next stop in Clinton, that city and DeWitt purchased and attached a 60,000 pound carload of corn sugar and citizens from Davenport and Scott County added a second car of flour and cereal. Just that quickly, after about 36 hours in the state, the friendship train continued its journey into Illinois and proceeded on to Chicago, meeting up with the other train that had al already arrived there. And then each proceeded on a separate journey. One tra train headed north along the New York Central Railroad, stopping in Indiana, Ohio, and New York. The other section took the southern route and proceeded through Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Of all the states that donated food to the Friendship Train, Iowa donated the most, pro proving once again to be a most generous people. The two trains had 81 cars of donated food when they left the state. You can possibly see the excitement expressed by the French and Italian representatives, as well as Drew Pearson. Amazing and unbelievable were words they used to express approval at the effort. One thing to keep in mind was that donations came from all over the state and not just from the six towns where the train stopped. This was a statewide effort. Drew Pearson wrote a column explaining the friendship train once the train had completed its journey. And in the article, Pearson praised the efforts of Iowans specifically for their generous contributions, much as Clara Barton had done a half a century earlier. He also told the story of two men from Iowa who rode the friendship train across the state, including Elsie Peterson of Stanton and Otis Tuttle of Norway, Iowa. The two men had paid for their passage to Europe the previous summer to see for themselves how desperate the food situation was there. As you may have guessed, the two men were completely supportive of the friendship train effort after seeing the heartbreaking scenes of starvation in Europe and telling the other passengers on board the friendship train that food was a means of winning friends and keeping the peace. Everywhere the friendship train went, it was greeted by huge crowds. The friendship train arrived in New York City where 270 rail cars were unloaded and reloaded onto ships. In one month and one week, the project had gone from an idea sketched out in Pearson's column to the delivery of hundreds of boxcars packed with food ready for loading onto ships and in one uh, of the world's busiest ports. The trains following the friendship train example would collect up hundreds more rail cars of food for delivery to Austria, Belgium, Holland, France, Italy, and Germany. For this cargo, Pearson wanted to be sure it arrived in both France and Italy before Christmas. It did. The ships carrying the cargo were gaily adorned with flags and the words, friendship train cargo, USA, or words to that effect printed on the sides as they left New York City. This 10,000 ton freighter sounded its horn as it passed the Statue of Liberty, long the symbol of friendship between America and France. When it crossed the Atlantic and bound for France, the holds of the ship contained the selfless donations from thousands of Americans, sending food and well wishes to complete strangers. Additionally, there was $78,000 in cash donated to purchase food in France. The ship arrived on December 17th, well before Christmas. It blared its horn and crowds of men, women, and children watched it dock. Volunteers that accompanied the ship across the ocean 
began tossing candy to the children gathered on the pier. The French arranged for a parade to celebrate the arrival of the ship and dock workers unloaded some of the food into 50 French trucks to deliver the cargo into Paris. The trucks formed the nucleus of the parade, the first of which carried a sign on the front written in French, which read, it would take 2000 trucks like this one to carry all of the gifts from the friendship train. The XSS area, the second ship with 5 million pounds of friendship train cargo sailed out of New York on December 12, 1947, bound for Italy. It arrived in country December 23rd, again before the Christmas holidays, and dock workers immediately unloaded it and sent the food into the nation. Since one of the main objectives was to ensure that the people of France and Italy knew that the food came from the United States, the French and Italians also had huge placards placed on them, letting the people know where the food came from. Of course, the communists in Italy and France hated the gesture, refusing to meet the trains, and communist newspapers railed against the effort. Just as in the United States, large crowds came out to see, see the trains in France and Italy, which operated just as the friendship train had in the United States, except in reverse. The trains in Italy and France stopped and unloaded the cargo as they came into the towns and villages. Additionally, the government had decided that the food from the friendship train was specifically reserved for the elderly and children who had suffered disproportionately when rations were cut during the war. While the friendship train experienced overwhelming support from the French people, this initiative was aimed at undermining communist movements in Europe, and the project was not popular with this group. After the friendship train had begun distributing its cargo in mid-December 1947, Maurice Schumann of the popular French Republican Party introduced a resolution asking that the French government officially thank the American people for the food sent to his nation collected through the friendship train. The communists in the Chamber of Deputies didn't know what quite how to react. And putting their heads together, they began whispering excitedly. They couldn't denounce the American project. It was far too popular with the, the French people, but it certainly undermined their effort to appear as the saviors of Europe. Conversely, if they voted for the American effort, it meant that they approved of this American gesture of friendship. To that point, the French Communist Party had voted against every proposal of American aid to France. In fact, the party even called for strikes, in part to prevent dock workers from unloading the American ships. In the end, the communists decided not to oppose the resolution, but voted in favor of it. The measure passed unanimously. The friendship train remained a direct threat to the communist movement, however, and on the night of January 30th, 1948, a warehouse in Paris containing 2,000 tons of friendship train food caught fire and much of the contents were destroyed. Over 400 Parisian firefighters showed up to battle the blaze, but the destruction was too advanced by the time they arrived to save the structure or its contents. The telephone wires to the warehouse had been cut, so it took the night watchman longer to summon help. He also reported that the blaze began as a series of explosions, leading investigators to suspect arson and more specifically, communist saboteurs. No one doubted that this was the work of communist saboteurs, then extremely active in France and bent upon undermining American influences in every possible way, recounted Gabrielle Griswold. Who is Gabrielle Griswold? While researching this topic last year, I found photographs supplied by this woman, who was an American helping to coordinate the friendship train activities in France in 1947. I asked the, the webmaster for permission to use those photographs. And she replied, I don't know, you're gonna have to ask her. I had a wonderful, a number of wonderful conversations with Ms. Griswold, who was incredibly helpful with this topic and is pictured here second from the right in 1947.
The people of France and Italy were incredible, incredibly thankful for the food. In France, the railway workers and veterans came together to think of a fitting gesture to show their gratitude to America. The solution was the Merci train or the thank you train, which went something like this. First, the call went out to the people of France to donate household items. Really anything would work like books or hats and other knickknacks. And they were loaded onto old World War I train cars called 40 and eights because they could hold 40 soldiers and eight horses. The French sent a boxcar to every state in the, in the Union, all 48 of them, with gifts from the people of France. Today, the Mercy train sent to Iowa can be seen at the Antique Acres Park near Cedar Falls. The Italians also discussed a gesture of thanks, but nothing really came of it. But to commemorate the achievements of the Friendship Train, two motion pictures came out of the effort. One made in the United States, a film created by Warner Brothers entitled The Friendship Train that focused on the effort to feed France. The other was an Italian production entitled Thanks America, made possible by donations by the Italian people of one to five cents each and focused on the effort to feed Italy. Orson Welles provided the commentary for the Italian film, while the Rome Symphony Orchestra provided the accompanying music. The Friendship Train was a triumph of imagination, addressing both the threat of hunger and the rise of communism for America's allies and former enemies. Americans, and Iowans specifically, donated generously, helping to fill hundreds of rail cars full of food bound for the starving people of Europe. Corporations donated the cost and effort of transporting the goods across the country and across the ocean, while truck drivers and dock workers did much of the labor behind the scenes. However, the friendship train did not solve the problem of communism in Europe. Only the end of the Cold War did that. Nor did it solve the issue of hunger in Europe. Only the generosity of the Marshall Plan in 1948 did that. The Friendship Train did nothing but pro provide hope for the people of Europe, the most valuable commodity of all, and letting Europeans know that the American people had not forgotten them and would not let them starve. Sometimes it's not the size of the effort that counts, but the fact that an effort has been made at all that matters. Finally, I included this picture just because I love it, at least the one on the right. As you can see, the child on the left has no shoes and it looks rather cold out as the children are dressed in coats. While the child on the right is giddy with the gift of a new pair of shoes. As a person who used to complain about getting clothes as a child at Christmas time, I didn't realize how lucky I was. Anyway, thank you, Iowa, for your generosity and kindness. And thank you to Jennifer Cooley and the State Historical Society of Iowa for allowing me to be here today. And now perhaps we have time for some questions. So I'll turn it back over to Jennifer and Matt. Of course, well, thank you, Dave. Uh, we have some time for questions, uh, but if you do have questions in the meantime, uh, please submit them through the Q&A feature right here on Zoom. Uh, but please note, we may not be able to get to all questions, but let's get started. So starting back, pre um, the friendship train, had Europe recovered from food insecurity caused by World War I before World War II broke out? L largely, or, or at least the, they, had, um, they had established a pattern for how to, how to provide, how to get food from where it was plentiful to where it was needed. Um, for, for example, many of the countries like, like Belgium and, and Holland were uh, in France were food secure. They could produce as, as much food as they needed with, with the exception of some, perhaps some fodder material going to livestock, but uh, Germany could not. And so one of the reasons that, that Germany, you know, overran some of the other countries was to provide food for, their, for, for Germany at the expense of some of these other, these other countries. Now, for example, during World War I, uh, or before World War I, many of these nations, Belgium specifically, had been able to provide most of their food, uh, except for the fodder material like I, I spoke of, 
And so when the Germans uh, began taking food, World War I and World War II, something had to be done. It, so Hoover coordinated through the Germans and the British at the time, who neither one had any real incentive to allow food shipments into, into Europe during World War I, but they did. World War II was, was much different. There were no food, um, food shipments coming into Belgium to feed anybody uh, to make up for the, the food that the, the Germans had taken. So to answer your question, largely they had established patterns of trade to, uh, to make up for the, the lack of food or, or specific food categories that they needed um, in different regions. This is particularly Western Europe. I hope that answers answered your question. Perfect, yes. Um, our next question, you talked a little bit about Herbert Hoover, um, but how did Herbert Hoover's tie to Iowa um, help him in the efforts to gather food donations? It, um, so Hoover was, um, as I explained, Hoover's uh, had a, a lot of expertise going back to World War I. And simply, uh, he, he was working more on a national level by the time of the friendship train, by the time the, the end of World War I came about. Um, so it couldn't have hurt, I think, to have a figure like Herbert Hoover, who was on the front page of every newspaper, you know, most days of the week, uh, for months at a time, talking about the effort to save food and and to gather food and and how we were going to to um, send this food to to Europe and and um, so although I don't think that he had a direct tie to to Iowa and the efforts there, I, I think it was probably a peripheral advantage to have somebody like Herbert Hoover with, with ties to Iowa um, making making headlines and publishing publicizing the the effort to collect up food perhaps uh, I, you know I don't think that that uh, that really pushed Iowa over the over the line to being the most generous folks maybe it's just something uh, something in the water that you know Herbert Hoover was such a a generous man with, with uh, with these efforts spanning from during World War II, during World War One through the post World War Two era, that, um, that that he did this, that he made these efforts, and 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 the the fact that the people of of Iowa were, were so generous as well. So going sense. from one, yeah, I mean, going from one Iowan Herbert Hoover to another Iowan uh, John Wayne, uh, a question we have is. How did the friendship train benefit? You talked about it uh, briefly uh, about from Hollywood influence, like you said, Ronald Reagan, John Wayne. How did it benefit from that? Um, again, generating publicity. This the the effort came about so quickly. I think it was October twenty seventh that that this thing became a reality. Hey, we're going to do it. And on November seventh, it leaves Los Angeles. The biggest challenge was uh, was well. It, Remember that the people of Europe are, are starving. Their, their harvest was absolutely devastated in 1947. And so the effort is one to get food quickly to Europe. And so the, the star-studded uh, gala, I mean, they, they've got a 15-mile parade route in Los Angeles. They've got all these stars coming out, and, and they're giving a coast-to-coast -coast, uh, live broadcast. I mean, it's even international. The, the biggest thing that the Hollywood stars could do was create the publicity, letting people know that this thing was out there, this effort, and that they could participate. And so I told you a number of times about how the, the um, not only the six towns in Iowa were, were instrumental in, in collecting all of the, this food, but there were rail cars coming from South Dakota and Minnesota and, uh, and surrounding states or, or food donations and cash donations that were also coming into Iowa. And, um, and some of that, that food was, was also connected up or, or rail cars were connected up in the different states, uh, people who wanted to participate in that. So, um, so the big thing that the SARS did was generate the publicity. As they still do for yes, multiple exactly. things. Um, another question we had, which 
it's pretty interesting. Uh, was there a reason why the six towns in Iowa were chosen? Um, I, I don't know the, how those towns were chosen. They, they were largely, well, they were on a railroad route, number one, but they were also the, the larger, uh, some of the larger towns that were uh, along those, that, that railroad route. But surprisingly, it was often some of the smaller towns that had the most donations. For example, uh, I, I read quickly that the, uh, like the, the city of Omaha was, was along the route. And I think they collected something like two train, two cars full of, of food, which was wonderful, but nothing compared to what some of the other the smaller towns, particularly in, in Iowa could come up with. And so, uh, so it was often a matter of, um, you know, how quickly a community could get organized. Uh, I told you about one one of the communities. Um, uh, they only had uh, like three days. The, the committee only worked for about three days, putting together their uh, their committee, their their program, and and they collected um, um, two or two or three rail cars. I can't re recall off the top of my head which which city it was, but um, often being from a small town was more beneficial to collecting the donations than being, being from a big city. Um, talking about collecting food, um, do you know how long the shipment of food last, excluding the food lost to the fire? Um, how long did that food last? It was, it was I, I looked all over for a, an article. It, doesn't that just happen when you're doing a research project? You, you remember reading somewhere about this, this great quote but I didn't include it here because I didn't have the backup, but it went something like, you know, the, the friendship train with, with, uh, with 270 rail cars would stretch, uh, I, I can't recall off the top of my head, you know, five miles, let's say. But the amount of food that they actually needed would stretch from New York City to San Diego. I mean, so the amount of food that the friendship train actually produced was, was not in the overall scheme of things extremely significant. It was the gesture behind the friendship train, uh, letting, you know, the, the biggest threat to, um, to, to Europe is, as far as communism went was not that the Russians were going to invade Western Europe. The biggest threat to, West, to Western Europe was the number of communist politicians who had been elected to the, to the parliament, uh, to their to their uh, chamber of deputies, to their to the uh, equivalent of Congress, that sort of thing. So the real danger was was Western Europe falling from within without a shot being fired. And so the the what the friendship train did was you know greatly publicized the event that look America has not forgotten you, which is which is the communist mantra. That was the that was their bumper sticker, so to speak. That uh, hey nobody loves you but uh, but us communists and you know throw in your lot with us and aren't you hungry and wouldn't things be a whole lot better if things had changed and so it was really just the publicity that was generated around this effort um, you know coming as it did from the people of America to the people of France it wasn't government to government it was people to people and so pretty soon after the friendship train arrives. That's when the the, uh, the big effort of the citizens' um, food committee really caught on. All those all those chickens that are cold, all the the the, uh, uh, the whiskey that, that's not produced, all of that grain is is uh, brought to, up to um, or, or is, is sent to to Europe, and the uh, the grain that's also being held back uh, uh, on the market by farmers that's that's brought forward as well. And so about night, also the Marshall Plan is, uh, is becoming a thing. And so in June of 47, uh, George C. Marshall goes to Harvard. He announces this idea of a, of a plan, an economic plan for Europe, but it gets stalled, right? I mean, the, the, um, the, the Democrats who have been in, 
in office ever since 1932, or lose both houses of Congress in 1946. And, and so the Republicans have some ideas about what they want to do, and it does not include sending a whole lot of money and, and food uh, to Europe or, or loaning money to Europe. And so the friendship train comes along at a time where it generates interest and publicity around the idea that Europe really needs help. And so it is just one of those things that helps push the, uh, the passage of the Marshall Plan in, in the spring of 1948. In fact, after the, uh, the Freedom Train publicity, I think 200 different members of Congress go to Europe to see for themselves what is, what is going on. And so another thing that it does is it, the Freedom Train, or sorry, the Friendship Train, there, there were two of them at this time, a free Friendship Train and a Freedom Train. So the Friendship Train, again, did not provide the food that saved Europe, but it was this idea. And it gets Congress interested in the idea of saving Europe. And, and they go see how devastated they are and um, how de devastated Europe is. And then by the, by the time that uh, it's time to vote on the Marshall Plan, you've got a whole lot of people in Congress who have been there. And there's, there's this excitement. There's this idea built up that we need to help help Europe. And, and it's an idea that the people embrace and, and politicians can't help but pick up on that as well. So that is a really long winded answer. I apologize for that. Um, but, uh, but but the important uh, the importance of the friendship tra train, again, not the food that it carried, but the idea and the, the excitement that it generated. This is our last question for you today. Um, but how did you become interested in this topic? So I, uh, so I wrote a, a book in, um, uh, about a million years ago now uh, about the Cold War in, in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana. And, and I, I just happened to come across this concept, this idea of the friendship train. And uh, so I explored it a little bit. And quite frankly, I, I didn't get some of the ideas right. Um, but, Exactly. And so I, but, but I was really interested in, in what it meant. And so when I, I started this next pro book project about starving Germany and, and, you know, that just kind of took off and looking at all these different ideas of, uh, and how everything is just so intertwined around food. It's, it's, it's often been a topic that's been ignored or, or rather relatively overlooked in, in the Cold War uh, historiography uh, and uh, and military uh, historiography um, and uh, and frankly in ag agricultural uh, uh, realms as, as well and so um, but what really got me to, interested in doing this particular topic for Iowa was in doing research and coming across the statement from Clara Barton that Iowans were the most generous folks. Uh, when it came to the Russian famine of 1891, and then coming across the uh, Drew Pearson quote about how Iowans were the most generous of people for the Friendship Train project. And so I just couldn't help but put those two ideas together. And, and then when doing research for this most recent book, um, you know, Herbert Hoover having clearly an, an Iowa connection um, and, and then it just kind of kind of fell into place the idea or the, the big ideas around this project, if uh, if that makes sense. So hopefully that answered your question. Huh? Yeah, of course. Thank, thank you for bringing, uh, you know, attention to this great story. It's a, it's a, a fabulous story that we all should know um, as well. And with that answer, we will bring the webinar to a close. And I think we all can agree this has been a very informative lunch. So thank you so much, Dave. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks of everybody course. for sticking around. Yeah, thank you everyone joining us today as well. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, please check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some other fantastic programs we have, such as our Goldies Kids Club activities for young historians, 
or watch video recordings of the Iowa Stories series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. We look forward to virtually seeing you all here again on Thursday, February 24th for our next Iowa History 101 webinar. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.